Hi, I'm Wayne Sullender from the Center for Global Health, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Lisa Obwogi, who's a faculty member in pediatrics and a member of the Center for Global Health. Uh, Lisa did her pediatrics training at the University of California in San Francisco after a, a medical degree she obtained here. She spent four years working in Kenya, including time as the deputy country director for Family AIDS Care and Education Services, which was a PEPFAR-funded effort. Uh, and her current research focuses on pediatric HIV, prevention of mother-to-child transmission, and TB HIV co-infection in children. She'll be speaking with us today about elimination of maternal-to-child transmission of HIV. Lisa. Thank you, Wayne. Can everybody hear me? I don't think I'll use the microphone if you can hear me. So um, glad to see people here. I didn't know if anyone would come, so happy to talk with you guys. So yes, we're talking about um, getting to zero, um, eliminating mother-to-child transmission. So we'll do talk about a little bit of background where we are right now in the world, um, then some history of prevention of mother-to-child transmission and specifically around research and interventions. Um, and then talk about the global plan to eliminate mother-to-child transmission, and you'll see this MTCT um, all throughout the presentation, so mother-to-child transmission. We'll talk about the current progress in eliminating mother-to-child transmission, and then gaps and our conclusion. Um, you feel free to interrupt me if you want to or ask questions at the end. So this is where we are right now. This is um, the 2014 UN AIDS report, and it reports on numbers in 2013. So it's saying that children um, under 15 years of age estimated to be living with HIV are around 3.2 million in the world. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa has the bulk of those infections, 2.9 million children there living with HIV. And we estimate that 90% of those have come from vertical transmission or mother-to-child transmission. The number of newly infected children uh, in 2013 is 240,000 overall, and 210,000 of those were in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. So you can see the numbers are still pretty staggering, um, still a huge number of children living with HIV and a huge number getting infected every year. Let's compare that to what's going on in the U.S. in a developed country. So um, with treatment during pregnancy and delivery and the avoidance of breastfeeding, Transmission is less than 1% um, in the United States. According to the CDC, um, their last numbers that I found were in 2010, and they estimated that only 217 children um, under 13 years of age were diagnosed with HIV in the U.S. They don't break that down into children who were foreign-born um, and may have immigrated to the U.S. and were diagnosed here. So we don't actually know if those were mother-to-child transmission for people who received care in the U.S. We know that the number of women with HIV giving birth in the U.S. has increased quite a bit. It's up by 30 percent from 6 to 7,000 in the year 2000 to over 8,000 in 2006. So we are having more women delivering in the United States, um, but relatively fewer delivering babies who end up with HIV. If we talk about mother-to-child transmission in Colorado, um, which the team from CHIP um, is directly um, involved with and responsible for a lot of the success. Between 2008 and 2012, there were approximately 20 to 30 children who were HIV exposed um, each year. And the last reported perinatal transmissions occurred in 2008, and there were only four. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other updates on that. Um, and two of those were actually born outside of the U.S. and then came um, into Colorado. So again, we have small numbers, fortunately, of children being born with HIV in Colorado and the U.S. overall. <clears throat> so a little bit about background. I don't know everybody's background here, so I'll talk a little bit about um, transmission and how it happens. So as I said, 90% of HIV infections in children are a result of mother-to-child transmission. And that happens in lots of different time periods, during the mother's pregnancy, during <coughs> delivery, and postpartum. So the top of this slide is showing you for breastfeeding children, that in utero transmission may be around 5 to 10 percent, intrapartum, so during delivery, 10 to 20 percent, and during breastfeeding, 10 to 20 percent. So overall, in children who are breastfed and in a mother who doesn't receive any sort of intervention, maybe 30 to 45 percent of those children are going to end up with HIV. So it's not a done deal, right? Not every child born to a mother who has HIV is going to get it. It really depends on how sick she is, her viral load, if she has other infections, um, a lot of other things that play into it. 
Then for non-breastfeeders, the majority of transmission is going to happen during delivery, 10 to 20 percent, and overall 15 to 30 percent of children who are not breastfed may end up with HIV. So the history of perinatal transmission. Um, I think we could talk for days about this history, and it's really fascinating and controversial, and it um, includes some ethical dilemmas and some missteps along the way. We'll touch on them a little bit, um, but I think it's a very interesting history, and I want to just talk us through it without doing a ton of studies, um, but just to give you some background. So in 1982, shortly after HIV was um, discovered, the first report of HIV in a child um, was made. A year later, it was confirmed that vertical transmission could happen from mother to child. And then in 1985, the first U.S. guidance or guidelines were um, put out for pregnant women living with HIV, and basically they said that high-risk women, quote-unquote, should be tested for HIV um, and probably avoid breastfeeding. But there was no real, no, no intervention to necessarily give them, and the qualification of who was high-risk was a little bit questionable. So it ended up to the clinicians and people taking care of pregnant women to decide who they thought was high risk. And given our sort of prejudices that we had initially during the HIV epidemic, it was probably women that were thought to be sex workers or had multiple partners or who were poor. And it wasn't necessarily really targeting all women at risk for HIV. In 1987, um, AZT, Zidovudine, was tested in a large study in Thailand. It was found that it reduced um, HIV when it was given in pregnancy and delivery by 67%. So this was a great study. It was um, sort of called the, the long course of AZT, and it was given you know, during pregnancy and during delivery. Um, the controversy came in when people thought, well, people living in Africa and lower income countries are not going to be able to implement this kind of a course. They're not going to be able to give Zidobudine all during pregnancy, and they can't give it IV during delivery because women don't deliver in healthcare facilities. And so new studies came up that um, were below maybe what you would say was the new standard of care. So shorter courses of zidovudine and single-dose nevirapine were tested, and that kind of established um, some tension in African countries and in lower resource settings where people questioned, why are you testing something that you know will be inferior to what you've shown is effective. Um, and that's, that's a story that sort of continues today and a tension that still exists. So it wasn't until 1995 that the U.S. suggested universal opt-out testing during antenatal care. Um, and that was just a recommendation, not necessarily something that was standard. Then late in the 1990s, Botswana was the first country to initiate um, prevention of mother-to-child transmission with short course AZT. So that was less than that longer course of AZT, but it's what they could they could manage. And in 1997, probably one of the next biggest controversial um, parts of the history of perinatal transmission, WHO recommends replacement feeding. So they realized that transmission occurred during breastfeeding, and the suggestion was that you should wean off of breastfeeding if possible and do replacement feeding. Um, there was a lot of work done to see could you provide formula to women who were breastfeeding and were HIV infected. Um, and it really backfired. Um, I'll show you what happened a little bit later on. Early in the 2000s, um, single-dose nevirapine with or without AZT was shown to be um, effective at reduced transmission by about 50%, which was actually quite good and a lot easier to implement. So that's really what started rolling out in low- and middle-income countries, except that still most women didn't receive um, that care. In 2003, rapid weaning was recommended. So if you were going to breastfeed until six months because you couldn't replacement feed, they suggested you stop immediately at six months, over two weeks. Um, even when I was in Kenya a few years ago, we were, we were talking about this, talking about quick weaning to cow's milk and um, solid foods at six months of age. That also backfired. So in 2006, exclusive breastfeeding and gradual weaning with an emphasis on ARV, antiretroviral prophylaxis, during breastfeeding and pregnancy was actually introduced. And the reason that this um, you know, infant feeding recommendation changed is that there were big studies, and one in particular from Zambia, that showed that even if you didn't end up being HIV infected, if you were HIV exposed and you were rapidly weaned, your risk of death increased several fold, and your risk of mortality from diarrhea and other diseases also increased, um, your chances of being hospitalized. 
So it really turned out that rabid weaning was a bad idea. Replacement feeding was a horrible idea because it wasn't possible to provide all these women with formula, nor was it possible to provide them with safe water. And so it, it got to the point where um, WHO had to back up and say exclusive breastfeeding till six months and then gradual weaning. Um, I used to, when I taught PMTCT in Kenya, I used to talk to healthcare providers about actually calculating the costs of replacement feeding. This was before the guidelines backed up because I never really felt comfortable with them. I would have them calculate, so for you know, a canister of formula that you're going to use probably one or two in a week, how much is it going to cost for six months of formula feeding? And that doesn't include getting safe water, having clean spoons or bottles or whatnot to use, and it always was prohibitive. And that was the one thing that um, helped healthcare workers understand it. So in 2010, WHO changed their guidelines um, for PMTCT and starts talking about this option A and option B. So how many people have heard about option A versus option B? A few of us. So I'm going to um, skip to that slide and just explain it a little bit more. So um, the world of HIV just loves abbreviations and um, shortcuts. So option A here at the top um, is describing what should be done um, in countries that couldn't give um, heart for all women. So it says that if you have a CD4 count less than 350, um, you should start heart and continue for life. So that was the qualification for starting heart. But if you had a CD4 count that was higher than that, you would start on AZT early during um, your pregnancy. Then during labor, you would take a single dose of nevirapine and start also a dose of AZT and lamivudine. And postpartum, you would take seven days of AZT and 3TC. Then your baby would get a single dose of nevirapine and stay on um, nevirapine or AZT for four to six weeks. Okay, So that was the guidance that was um, was put out in 2010 and that most countries were going to be able to adopt um, because they didn't have enough ART to start all women and there wasn't a lot of evidence yet that we should. Um, you can see it's a little bit confusing. So there's a lot of different things to do. We used to give out um, what we call mother baby packs. So they got an envelope and this was called your pregnancy pack and this was your delivery pack and this was your post delivery pack for your baby. And a lot of women just come for one antenatal visit. So you just found out you have HIV, you need to take these drugs, this one you take now, you take it twice a day, this one you take during labor, also take this one while you're in labor, after labor take these for a week, give your baby this one for a week. You can understand it was pretty confusing and complex. There was multiple steps and a lot of different pills. And this depended on you actually getting a CD4 count back and knowing if the woman should be on heart or should just be getting this option A. Option B um, was a new idea, and that was starting triple ARVs, or heart, and continuing um, throughout pregnancy or for life. We'll talk about that. Um, so the regular option B was starting triple ARVs, staying on for life if you had a low CD4 count, or stopping after breastfeeding if you had a higher CD4 count. And then the baby got that same nevirapine or AZT for 46 weeks. Option B plus was starting on heart regardless of your CD4 count and continuing for life, okay? And the baby got nevirapine. So that was the guidance around 2010. And countries were left to decide which one was best for them to implement. And the guidance at that time was saying that really we think the transmission rates should be about equivalent um, for both regimens. In 2011, um, the UNAIDS Joint Commission came together and had a global plan for the elimination of mother-to-child transmission. So we started changing the talk from prevention of mother-to-child transmission to actual elimination of mother-to-child transmission. And in 2011, Malawi was the first country to implement um, universal option B+, so heart for life for pregnant women. And they did this because um, their PMTCT program was failing and their ART program was also failing. They just weren't able to get enough people on ART. And so they, through commitments with CDC and PEPFAR and other people, decided to put every pregnant woman and pre breastfeeding woman on heart for life. Um, and they were the ones to lead the way with or without the evidence for it. Then in 2013, um, WHO guidelines change again. And now they recommend continuous ART therapy for pregnant women, preferably lifelong. So for those of you who know WHO or have ever um, you know, interacted with WHO guidelines, 
this is probably like the fastest change of guidelines that has happened in the history of WHO. It usually takes a while for guidelines to change. Um, and this is pretty rapid. And it, they're, they continue to change and really try and react based on um, the evidence that's coming out. So I said in 2010, WHO put out the option A versus option B. Then they sent out an update in 2012. And they said, actually, we think option B plus might be better. Um, for several reasons. One is it's a simplified regimen and service delivery. So you come, instead of giving you your post-delivery pack, your pregnancy pack, the baby pack, we're just going to start to unheart and have you stay on it. You can harmonize it with the adult ART programs and use the same regimen so that there's less confusion and it doesn't require a CD4. Um, you protect against this pregnancy and future pregnancies because we know women um, often are getting pregnant pretty quickly after their first pregnancy. It avoids the stopping and starting of ARVs, which we were concerned might lead to resistance. And it also prevented transmission in discordant couples, of which there are many, and improved clinical health outcomes for women. Okay. So finally, we get to 2013, and WHO says it clearly. All HIV-infected pregnant and breastfeeding women should be on ART and continue for life. Okay. And those are their, the last guidelines that they've put out so far. So what progress have we, wait, we made? So they estimate that 1.1 million HIV infections have been averted in children less than 15 years of age since the start of PMTCT programs, and that new cases of pediatric infections have declined by more than 50% in just the last several years, which is actually huge gains. Countries that are transitioning to option B plus are shown here. So the ones in dark green, Rwanda, Uganda, and Malawi are ones who have already accepted option B plus and are rolling it out fully. The lighter green, um, the MOH has supported these and planning to roll out. And the yellow and orange are considering it um, but haven't started. Okay. So the countdown to zero. I told you in 2011, UNAIDS came up with this plan to eliminate new infections in children by 2015. They identified 22 or 21 priority countries for the global plan, and they're listed here. And if you scan through quickly, you'll see that all but one, all but India, are from Africa. Okay, And they account for 89% of all HIV-positive pregnant women in low- and middle-income countries. The goals by 2015 were to reduce the number of new HIV infections among children by 90% from a baseline set in 2009. And that really meant elimination didn't mean zero infections. It meant reducing the mother-to-child transmission rate to less than 5% in breastfeeding populations and less than 2% among non-breastfeeding populations. It also included a goal to reduce maternal AIDS-related deaths by 50%. So if you're on track with your calendar, 2015 is a few weeks away. So where are we? Where, how, have we how far have we gone? So this is kind of um, a busy slide. But let's just take a look at it. So green here are the goals um, according to this global plan. So the first um, columns here are the reduction of new cases of pediatric HIV infection. We said we wanted to reduce them by 90%. So as of 2011, we'd reduce them by 26% from the 2009 baseline. The mother-to-child transmission rate, our baseline was 28% in 2009 and had gone down to 21% in 2011 with a goal of 5%. Maternal ARV coverage actually doubled between 2009 and 2011. So now 60% of women were accessing ARVs, although we wanted 90% by 2015. Um, reduction in maternal deaths, we had reduced them by 21% in 2011. And ART coverage for children who required it uh, was only at 28%, so only one out of three children who needed ARVs, based on old guidelines, actually, um, were receiving them in 2011. So I think you can see progress there. But obviously, um, if 2015 is three weeks away, uh, a little bit short of the goals so far. So this shows it to you in a different way. So the number of new child HIV infections in these 21 burden countries, high burden countries, and the projected targets. So a 60% reduction um, since 2001 to 2013. And you can see in this blue dotted line um, where we'll be if we continue at our current pace, not at our goal in 2015, and where we will go if we really reach our goal, which is down to here. Okay. This slide is showing you the treatment gap 
So in these 21 priority countries, this is showing the proportion in each, um, that each country um, bears in terms of their shortfall in providing women with antiretrovirals. So Nigeria is far and away the bulk here, 30%. So they really have a long way to go, and they have a huge population. They're the most populous country in um, sub-Saharan Africa. Uganda is next. We said they are rolling out option B, followed by Mozambique, and then these other countries fill in below. Okay. In terms of the decline in mother-to-child transmission, these countries under the green label are ones that, if they continue going, they'll meet their goal by 2015. Um, and there are several of them, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa. So those countries are really on target. A moderate decline um, under the yellow banner, they need to improve in order to reach it by 2015, but still possible. And then slow or no decline um, under the red. And you'll see that Angola, Chad, Democratic Republic of Congo, Nigeria, some of these countries, conflict zones, um, and lots of political issues in those countries. But just to give ourselves a little bit of a reality check, even if we meet this goal of reducing um, transmission and 90% of child infections, 40,000 children each year will still be born with HIV. So eliminating mother-to-child transmission really isn't eliminating, it's reducing. Um, and it's still leaving 40,000 infants with HIV every year. Um, and right now, only 67% of pregnant women with HIV are receiving effective PMTCT treatments. And that really was that option A um, option, not option B plus. So we have a long way to go if we're really going to get this done. So kind of getting back to basics, what do we do to reduce mother-to-child transmissions? Well, new infections obviously um, equal the number of HIV-positive pregnant women times the mother-to-child transmission rate. So there's four prongs of PMTCT that we talk about traditionally, um, and we have to target each prong if we want to reduce mother-to-child transmission. The first one is primary prevention of HIV in women. So that means women not getting infected, obviously. The second one, and sometimes controversial, is prevention of unintended pregnancies. So that does not mean forced sterilization. It does not mean counseling women with HIV that they shouldn't have children. It does not mean providing... Um, you know, family planning in a cultural way that's not acceptable, but it does mean trying to prevent unintended and unwanted pregnancies. Then the third prong is the regular prevention of mother-child transmission using drugs, usually. And then finally, the care for HIV-infected women and children. So primary prevention of HIV in women, it starts with knowing your status, so getting tested. And there has been huge pushes in low- and middle-income countries to roll out lots of testing and a lot more people know their HIV status. I think um, that's very clear. Treatment of discordant couples is actually a really important part of this. So we know from recent studies that reduction in transmission to a negative partner can happen if that partner is on heart, about 90% reduction. So WHO now recommends treating all of the positive people in um, a discordant relationship. And then empowerment of women so that they're not engaged in high-risk behavior and that they have the ability to decide when they want to have sex and to do it safely. Easier said than done, obviously. So we're showing only a slight decline in the new number of new HIV infections among young women um, in these 21 priority countries. It's showing you here until 2011, and it's actually continuing to go down in 2012 and 2013. So that, that is progress, but it's probably not enough to really get to our goal. Here is a slide showing you the unmet family planning need. So this is according to surveys that were done in these countries, and underneath it shows you the two different years that they compared, and how many women said that they would like to have family planning but didn't have access to it or couldn't get it. And it's up, you know, between 15 and 35 percent, and actually in st studies and other um, research that I've read, it can be as high as 60 percent of people saying that they actually don't want another child in the next few years and really would like to have family planning. And so we're not reaching that goal either. Um, there's also, you know, around mother-to-child transmission, you can provide the drugs, but you have to do several things, and that is test people so they know their status. You have to get them the treatment, and you have to retain them in care. And that is not always easy no matter what setting you're in. So that brings us to the idea of the care continuum, and this is true for H HIV care in general and pediatric care, adult care, and also PMTCT care. So this continuum starts with um, antenatal care cl 
clients, sorry, um, tested for HIV. So this is from um, a Kenyan sample that was done in 2012, and it was showing in Kenya that nearly 100% of women who came for an antenatal visit were tested, so that's great. And 80 to 90% of Kenyan women come for at least one visit. So at least most of these women knew their HIV status. But then it drops down a little bit. So if you look at the number of women who were issued ARV prophylaxis, it was less than 80%. Then if you look at the number of exposed infants who were issued ARV prophylaxis, it drops down to less than 60%. And the number of infants who are tested um, at six weeks of age, around 35%. So the continuum really drops off, and we don't know if people are actually taking their drugs, even if they're issued them. So those are major gaps for us. So again, where are the gaps? 50% of HIV-infected pregnant women are lost between antenatal care registration and delivery. 34% of HIV-exposed infants are lost to follow up by three months and 45% of infants are lost after HIV testing. So we're, we have huge losses to follow up along the care continuum. Other gaps, um, access. So I talked to you about Nigeria not even having access to um, PMTCT treatment. Acceptability, I mentioned to you, when a woman comes for her first antenatal and probably only antenatal visit, finds out she's HIV positive, then is told to take drugs and take them for life, go home and disclose to her partner and her family, and the acceptability of that intervention is really difficult. Um, there's been a lot of drops off, drop offs in Malawi um, in terms of option B. So women will take it, and it, they're showing that they take it and they continue through pregnancy and delivery and the first part of breastfeeding. But by the time you get to a year postpartum, there's a lot of attrition of women dropping off there. Um, a lot of women, because the message has always been you start taking ART when you're sick or when your CD4 count is low. And now we're really changing that message and saying everybody should be on it. You should be on it for your own health. But in Malawi in particular, you know, adults, adult men have a different criteria than a pregnant woman does. It's a confusing message to send to a community and to keep them um, engaged and wanting to take those drugs when they're not pregnant anymore and their child is negative is pretty difficult. You have to identify them, so you have to test them. You have to give them the right treatment. So healthcare workers have to understand what the treatment regimens are. They have to have access to the drugs and they have to be able to give them out. Stigma, discrimination, and gender-based violence are still major issues. Um, so women being afraid of going home and disclosing to their partners that they're HIV positive, um, being discriminated against even by healthcare workers in the facility, and fears and true um, gender-based violence happen a lot, and that's an issue that is difficult to address. I'll talk a little bit more about training of healthcare workers. Um, adherence. So again, if you're going to start the drugs, you have to adhere to them, and we aren't really measuring that very well or understanding very well how many women are adhering to the drugs once they're issued them. Retention, we've talked a lot about, and primary prevention as well. So I just wanted to highlight for you a small um, project that we did in Kenya, um, and we called it Infant Morbidity and Mortality Review. So we actually, in our setting, have a decently low mother-to-child transmission rate. It started around 10%, 8%. So we thought we were doing fairly well, but we're still having transmission. So let's try and find out what it is, what are our gaps, um, by looking at infants who ended up being HIV positive, we had 45 cases we looked at, and infants who ended up being HIV negative, 45 controls. So what we found in terms of maternal factors was that there was a lack of HIV awareness in mothers of infants who ended up being HIV positive, so they didn't know their status. Maybe they missed coming to the ANC clinic. There was a failure to access antiretrovirals. So obviously, if you don't access antiretrovirals or take them, then the chances of your child being positive are a lot higher. And poor maternal adherence. So none of these are surprising things um, that all led to infants being positive. <clears throat> Infant-related factors included late enrollment of infant to follow-up. So remember, we were trying to give infants prophylaxis while the mother was breastfeeding. And if you don't bring the infant, then you're not going to continue taking um, the drugs. And it probably just shows a lack of access and engagement in care overall. Poor adherence to infant prophylaxis. So obviously, if you're missing doses, that's going to increase your risk. And mixed infant feeded. So that means introducing solids prior to six months of age, which is just super common. Um, and then additionally, what we thought was interesting is that mothers of cases were also significantly less likely to report having received clinic-based HIV education and counseling or to report good counseling on medications. So remember, these healthcare workers are doing multiple jobs at one time. They're doing antenatal care. They have to do malaria prophylaxis. They have to give um, infant 
feeding advice, they have to give delivery advice, they're giving iron pills, they're testing for HIV and syphilis, and then they're also supposed to counsel on HIV and HIV medications. And there are lay counselors, there are all support staff there, but mothers of cases, children who ended up being HIV infected, said they really got poor service. And we thought we were doing a pretty good job. That it was our job to teach health care workers how to do this. So that's just one small you know, group of people that we looked at to sort of see where are our gaps still. And you can imagine how you have to address these um, in a low resource setting. So I talked to you about training healthcare workers and we went through option A and option B. And I just kind of wanted to show you a schematic of the 2010 recommendations from WHO about PMTCT. So imagine that healthcare worker that I just talked about doing this. This is up on the wall in front of them and they just found out that they have an HIV positive woman they have to pick the right algorithm. They may not, they probably don't have a CD4 yet. They have to figure out which drugs to give her. They have to find out if they're available. And then they have to try and tell the woman how to take them properly. So it's, it was really complex. Skip forward to now, and it's a lot simpler. We're saying mother to child transmission is very preventable. The recommended regimen is tenofovir, lamivudine, and efavirenz, or um, Zidovudine, Lamipidine, and Epavirenz, and it's continuous lifelong heart for pregnant and breastfeeding women. So it's gotten a lot simpler, I hope, for healthcare workers. They don't need a CD4, they don't need other labs. This is what they start, and that's what women should stay on. So if we're talking about the ever-changing landscape, um, a new study just came out a few days ago, the PROMISE study. And the PROMISE study has been going on in seven different countries, um, India and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and it was looking at this option B plus versus option A, basically. And they came out and they said what a lot of us believed was true but never had proof of, that triple ARVs for pregnant women are more effective in preventing mother-to-child transmission of HIV during pregnancy than a single drug-based regimen. And they enrolled over 3,500 women and showed this. And during their um, interim study monitoring, they stopped that arm short. So all women will be getting triple ARVs during pregnancy. They're continuing the study during breastfeeding. So they're going to continue to compare um, triple ARVs versus single drug regimens during breastfeeding and see which is better. Um, but it looks possible that triple ARVs will be confirmed conclusively to be better. Um, a little bit concerning um, results from the study showing that there were some increased risk of prematurity um, in both arms of the, they had two different regimens um, of women on triple ARVs and increased um, congenital defects. So if we're recommending a lot of women be on these drugs, um, and there will be a lot of women, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, we're worried about what those effects are going to show. And prematurity is a major cause of neonatal mortality, especially in developing countries. So it's something that we have to really be aware of. So I want to leave you with hopeful thoughts about where we're going. Um, and I love this quote from Christopher Reeve that says, once you choose hope, anything is possible. So less than 200,000 new pediatric infections in 2013 in those 22 priority countries. And that's the first time that that's happened since the peak of the HIV epidemic, since the 1990s. We haven't seen those few um, new infections in children. So that's a huge accomplishment. There's decline in new pediatric infections in all of those 21 priority countries. Even though some are fast and some are slow, they're all declining, which is good news. And the proportion of pregnant women um, who have HIV who are getting antiretrovirals has doubled in the last five years. And that's also a huge accomplishment, nearly 70% of women receiving some sort of antiretrovirals. Now, again, whether they're able to actually take them and continue taking them is a big question. And the drug regimens are becoming a lot more efficacious and a lot simpler um, for women to take. One pill once a day um, is a much better regimen than what I was describing before. So I think there's hope. I think that we can get to our goals, but it's going to take a lot more effort, a lot of concentrated, focused work in local situations and understanding what the gaps and barriers are there um, in order to reach this, this goal. So I'm happy to take questions or hear your comments and your thoughts. Um, this is a woman with permission, of course, and her baby um, in Kenya in one of our PMTCT programs, and um, she's happy to hear the good news that she has a negative baby. So thanks very much.
mm -hmm. with that one specifically, primarily because they would have positive tests, or we've also seen negative tests. Both. Yeah, so sometimes finding out that your infant is positive obviously is very traumatic, and so you can lose um, women, baby pairs after that. And then especially after they're negative, after six weeks, thinking like, I'm good to go, um, when really we wanted to continue following you till 18 months and continue you or the baby on therapy. Um, so lots of dropouts there. But it's, it's confusing because they're still coming for immunizations but the two clinics and the two services aren't talking to each other. So they show up to the facility, but nobody's checking, are you HIV exposed? What should we do about it? So integration of services is another approach to trying to address those gaps. Good question. So yes. Retention is such a big issue. Do you have comments about some of the approaches that different places are using, like one or another? Well, interesting you ask, um, because that's my... My research study um, that we're doing in Kenya right now is on retention around option B plus for women. Um, and things that we're looking at that have some basis of um, efficacy are text messaging, so text messaging reminders. And what we find in, from preliminary research is that they really need to be personalized. So they say, hi, Wayne. Um, we're glad you came to clinic last week. Um, the health of your baby, Simon, is really important. Please come back next month for your next appointment. But they don't mention HIV and they don't mention ARVs. Um, so we're testing that versus community mentor mothers. So mentor mothers are women living with HIV, recent experience, going through PMTCT, who go and do home visits, do counseling, try and bring back those women who get lost um, along the way. Other ways of um, doing retention are just regular phone calls when people default, calling them, trying to get them to come back. Um, support groups are obviously very important. Um, a lot of tracking, a lot of just hard work going door to door and getting women to come back. A lot of people also say they don't understand the, the need and the reason um, to come back, so more education around that. And then of course the cues that happen you know, at these facilities when you have to go and take the whole day off of what you're doing and wait hours and hours to be seen um, is really difficult. And um, that hasn't been substantially addressed in any country that, that I'm aware of. Really good question. So um, other studies have done that through modeling, and they think because of the saved um, lives, maternal mortality, maternal morbidity, and infant morbidity and mortality, that option B plus will be much more cost effective. Uh, they didn't put anything out on that in terms of promise yet. I'm sure that they'll be looking at that. So looking at the two arms, the women on triple ARVs had a transmission rate of like 0.5 and 0.6%. And in the women getting the single drug regimen, it's 1.8%. So they're still both quite low, but double in the single drug regimen. Um, so I don't know how to do that cost-effective modeling, but yeah, okay. somebody will. Somebody yeah. will do it. And the earlier modeling studies are showing it to be cost-effective. Yeah. Yes? How, how are um, women that they were on shared after they began their option B plus and continue on as opposed to the placebo? Yeah, so um, there's a transition to using viral load. So in Kenya, which is a little bit more advanced than a lot of countries, um, viral load is being introduced as routine monitoring every six months. Um, in most other places, it's still CD4 every three to six months, and then possibly a viral load if you suspect treatment failure clinically or immunologically. Um, Follow-up of like treatment toxicity is pretty poor. There are recommendations about getting repeat CBCs, checking renal function, um, those sorts of things, but oftentimes they don't happen or aren't interpreted well. So that kind of follow-up is, is lagging behind. Have you seen much uh, CNS-toxicity? With the fabrins? Um, you know, it's tolerated pretty well, and it's, um, it's really cultural. People come in describing it in different ways than um, what we may be used to hearing people say here. People do talk about bad dreams, 
um, talking to people who aren't there. Um, you can see frank psychosis. We've definitely seen that. Um, but we use it a lot more liberally and freely than um, is used here, for sure, basically because it's cheap and effective. Yeah. Questions? Concerns? I'm curious about uh, so documentation. Because um, I know some countries that it's family is responsible to carry around their home. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, in Kenya, there's um, patient care files. It's called the blue card. It's a two pager. Um, and it's basically a flow sheet with like 12 visits on it. So it's minimal documentation that's kept at the facility. Um, so you document things like CD4 viral load, family planning uptake. It's a lot of like crazy coding. You have to understand what FPCT, XYZ means um, to really interpret it. But that's what Kenya has moved towards, along with a lot of paper registers that are super time consuming to fill. And that's what a lot of other countries also use, is those paper registers to kind of document how many people enroll today, how many people are taking drugs, um, but not super efficient. Um, our program in Kenya uses an electronic medical record system, but we fill out that paperwork, um, the provider fills it out, and then we enter it electronically. It's not a point of care system. Um, and I think people are actually going to move towards that a bit faster than what we might think because they can jump to tablets, which are pretty use, easy to use at the bedside, can be programmed and be pretty user friendly. Um, so that helps with follow up, but right now it's all paper based with like a diary where lay healthcare workers say, okay, your next appointment is this date, then they look on that date in the diary. These people didn't show up. They wait three days. If they don't show up, they call them, then they go to their home. Um, so it's pretty time intensive. Yeah. Yes, Betsy, and then. So how, <laughs> all these problems that start getting Um, what are you thinking of in particular? Well, I don't know. Are there other people? <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering. TV? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I think that's a good question. Um, I would say, first of all, that like just grossly comparing retention in um, sub-Saharan African countries on HIV medications, it's better than in the United States. So it's around 70 to 80 percent, and we have retention in like the 60 percent, um, according to the recent CDC guidelines. So it's better than what we're able to accomplish here. Obviously, different populations and different epidemics. Um, compared to something like TB, so TB is, you know, six, nine months course and um, a little bit closer follow-up um, in terms of dots being done and having to pick up your medications weekly or at the end monthly. So um, I would say retention and completion of TB treatment is better than overall retention in HIV care. Um, there's not a lot of other good chronic models um, to compare at, and that's what, actually what a lot of people talk about is that in these settings, there's not a chronic care model. It's a lot of emergency care, one-time visits. You have a fever, it's probably malaria. Here's your drugs, you know, here's your immunization. But there isn't really a model for this long-time care, and that's why it's such a huge burden on the medical system there. Not even a cultural norm for, oh, I have to take medicine every day in order to make my life, which is something lots of people do. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, people are getting there with cardiac disease, so obviously heart disease and hypertension are um, the next big thing that's um, a big issue in these countries. But people can go over the counter to the chemist and just pick up whatever antihypertensive they feel like that day. They don't have to, you know, go through the HIV clinic to get their free drugs. So it's a little bit less of a burden on them in that way. But I think it's a it's a really big issue. Yes. I was just kind of curious about um, thinking canal in the bush where. Mm -hmm. So for patients that may be seeing one clinic, but due to drought or something, or having to move somewhere else, and there's another clinic closer to them, yep. is there documentation that they can take to these other clinics so they can see what's already been done and what they need? Right. Great question. And that happens a lot. So. Um, I'll tell you two different instances. One is pregnant women. So pregnant women, you know, marry and move to where their husband is to live. And then when they deliver, they often go home. 
And we lose them a lot that way, you know, when they go back to live with their mom and take care of the baby for the first little while. And we don't know if they're still getting care because they're somewhere else getting care and accessing the clinic or we've really lost them. So maybe our retention is better than what we think. Maybe it's worse, we're not sure. People are trying to do um, thumbprint scanning at clinics so that you actually know. And that also prevents like double enrollment and that sort of thing. So we know our numbers and we can know retention, but obviously you need a wide net um, to really understand that. The second population that I know a lot about is the fisher folk population around Lake Victoria. So very migratory, they go where the fish are, depending on the season and the weather, and they move around a lot. And they have a really high burden of HIV. In some places, 30 to 40 percent of that population is HIV infected, which is just crazy. Um, and we had a lot of trouble initially because there's a strict cultural norm about you come to this clinic, I gave you your medicine, you are here, this is where you're going, and they didn't have that file that they carried with them. So we've moved to a setting where we give them that file card so they can take it to any clinic and they should be accepted and at least get refills or you know interim care until they return back to their main clinic. Also trying to do things like what we call moonlight clinics. So fishermen fish overnight or you know fish at odd times and so they need a clinic that's at a different time than what's usually provided. So trying to do things like that to allow people who are migratory moving around um, to access care. People like in Turkana and you know, really nomadic tribes, it's really awful. I know people working in those areas have really struggled um, to give continuous care to people. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Thank you.